four, three, two, one. Okay, in time you're ready. You go. Okay. How did uh, the Paramount come about? The Paramounts. Um, now, I'm going to think quite a long way back for that one. The Paramounts, well, I think I started the Paramounts, really, um, because there was a local group near where we, uh, we all lived um, of older players that were called the Rockefellers, who I admired a, a lot, you know, I think they were great. So I wanted a group exactly the same, so that's how the Paramounts came about, really. How did you come to play the guitar? Um, I wanted to be like Elvis, and Elvis had a guitar, so that was that. Was that. What were some of your favorite records when you were growing up? <coughs> some of my favorite records. Um, when I was very young, you mean? Yes. Well, I was a big Elvis fan. I liked Jerry Lee Lewis and um, Carl Perkins. And then I got into B.B. King and James Brown and Bobby Bland and people like that. Who are some of your musical influences? Um, some of my musical influences, well, um, nearly all the black music I've ever heard. Um, probably uh, Hen Hendrix more than anybody, I would think. Um, people like B.B. King were a very big influence and Otis Rush, Muddy Waters. But I mean, the list is very, very long, you know. How did the change from the Paramounts to Procol Harum evolve? Well, we went, uh, we went about as far as we could go with the Paramounts, I think. Um, let me see. I think um, I left the Paramounts. They were still going. Um, because I was getting more and more into blues and um, wanted to start a blues band of my own. And in fact did. Uh, in the meantime, Paramounts sort of stopped and regrouped as Procol Harum. As um, Gary linked up with uh, a lyricist called Keith Reed. And uh, they recorded White Shade of Pale. And uh, that was a hit. But um, they needed a guitar player and a drummer. So they called me and uh, B.J. Wilson, who was the drummer from the Paramounts, to come in. So that's how that came about. What are your memories of that band? Pretty good, really. I mean, I think uh, we did a lot of good work. And um, we, uh, we discovered America together, you know, and uh, did a lot of touring over here. And um, I, I think it was really being in that band that opened up the way for me to, to be able to come to America as a solo artist and start, you know, doing that. What songs do you feel show Procol Harum at your best? Um, well, I think their best record was White Shade of Pale, and that was before I joined them. I thought that was a classic thing, you know, a classic piece of music. Um, Salty Dog was, was a nice album, and Broken Barricades, the last one before I left, was excellent. Yeah. Uh, in Procol Harum, songs like uh, Repent While Purgis, In Hell Twas and I featured great lead breaks from you. And later, you wrote songs like Juicy John Pink, Whiskey Train, Simple Sister, that brought your guitar sound to the front of the band. Uh, how did those songs evolve? Um, I think uh, I was starting to, to um, develop as a writer only by being around uh, Gary and Matthew who, who were writing already. Um, I, I, don't, I didn't ever think of myself as being a naturally gifted writer, you know, it just I think uh, the competition of having to come up with something of your own, you know, was what started me. So um, I just basically drew on 
my rhythm and blues and blues roots to write those songs, really. Um, Jack Bruce, I admire him a lot. I think he's great. And uh, Jimmy Dewar, I love his singing. That's about it. I didn't. I didn't, never really mixed with musicians, not in terms of um, getting together to jam or anything like that. Can you describe the rock music scene in England in the late sixties? Probably not. <laughs> um, I think it was a very creative time. Probably the most creative time that I th I can think of for uh, rock as opposed to rock and roll, because obviously the 50s was incredibly creative as well. But um, I think of um, the 60s as being the end of an era rather than the beginning of one. It was kind of like the culmination of the 50s to me, really, because it was all, all the influences were coming out of the late 50s and the early 60s. Uh, this show that we're doing is about pro the progressive rock scene, uh, highlighting bands such as Procol Harum, Jethro Tull, Genesis, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, Yes, King Crimson. Do you feel Procol Harum was an influence on any of these bands? Um, I wouldn't think so, no. I don't even know if I'm qualified to, to say that because I haven't really heard any of those bands that you know, just in passing I've heard them, but I don't really know anything about them musically. Okay. Um, I don't really like that kind of music. Really. Okay. Uh, you've never hid your admiration for Hendrix. Uh, was Song for a Dreamer written for him? That's right. Uh, Keith and I wrote it as a tribute to him. Mm. We saw the last show he did before he died, you know. That was the first time I'd seen him as well, so it had quite an impact on me. Where was that show? That was in uh, Berlin. Um, <coughs> what were your thoughts when you made your first solo LP, Twice Removed from Yesterday? What were you trying to, what did you set out to accomplish? Well, I think the main the main thing I've always wanted to do was to make the most soulful music possible that I could make. Um, play the most soulful guitar, really. Um, because all of the people that I admired, were that was what I admired about them, the fact that they were so soulful. When you were <coughs> in Procol Harum, um, what type of guitar did you play? Um, I played a uh, very, various amounts. So early on, I played a Gretsch solid body and then I changed to a Gibson solid body and then ended up playing a Stratocaster towards the end. And in your solo career on the first, you know, solo albums and stuff, you played Stratocaster? Always Stratocaster, since I was, since Procol Harum, yes. Okay. Um, your second LP, Bridge of Size, which was quite a big seller, very popular record, um, what did you set about to accomplish with that particular LP? Um, that was really just like the second part of the first album, the sort of direction I'd started in the first album. Um, all the things that were wrong with the first album I tried to sort of put right in terms of production and sound and just the general look of the whole thing and feel of it, you know. I tried to write better songs. Why do you think that LP was so successful? Um, because it was really good, <coughs> basically. On several uh, recent LPs you played with Jack Bruce, how did that association come about? Uh, well, I've always admired him, right, from Cream. And um, when I was with Procol, I always thought it you know, would be a great thing to play with him at the time. That was in 68 or something. And. Um, so I decided to have a change after an album called uh, Victims of the Fury that I did. And I just called him up and he was interested, so 
it seemed like a good idea at the time, you know. But were you happy with the results? No, not really. I can't say that I was, but uh, it was worth a go. I think it was definitely on paper. It looked like a really good thing, you know. When you worked with Keith Reed and Procol Harum and on the uh, LP Truce, did you adapt the words to the music or vice versa? Um, about half and half. Some of the some of the words were already written, and I wrote the music for them, and then. Other things, I got him to write the words to the music. How about with Jim Dewar when you worked with him? Um, we we mostly co-wrote the words when we worked work together on lyrics. Um, Matthew Fisher produced, I believe, your first two solo records. Um, are you still in touch with him at all? No, I haven't spoken to Matthew for some time. Uh, were you happy with his production job? On yeah, I think he did did a great job. Yeah. On the first two. We weren't so happy with the third one. The third one was a bit of a disaster production wise. We, uh, we switched um, engineers and we came to America to record and it didn't work out very well. What are your current musical activities? Um, currently I'm on tour in, in America. Um, I'm breaking in a new band and some new material, and um, I just want to see where it's where it's going really, before I make any big decisions or moves. Could you uh, sum up Robin Trower in a few sentences? Um. <laughs> no. Uh, I think I think uh, Robin Trower is probably someone who who had a go at uh, trying to do something quite difficult. Whether he made it or not, uh, I think only you know when you look back in a, in perhaps ten or twenty years, you'll know. Well, I think he definitely made it. Um, what is your overview of? rock music in the 80s? Um, well, I don't get to hear very much of it um, out of choice. What I do hear, um, what I miss most of all in rock music today is um, <clears throat> feeling. It's, it's just become incredibly lightweight and plastic, you know. Um, I think it's it's become such a manufactured thing, you know, a bit like sort of television really. Glossy to look at. It sounds like luxury goods, but when you look for something inside it, there's nothing there, you know. But um, obviously I don't hear a lot of it, so I mean obviously there is some good stuff out there, but it's just not getting through to me at the moment. What did you think of the punk scene? In the, uh, I, I kind of missed all that, I think. Some, I was over here, I lived over here for a while that was all going on. That was about 76, 77, 78 around there, wasn't it? And I was living in California, so I missed it. <laughs> um, Before the punk question, when you were talking about music today lacking feeling, why do you think that perhaps music in the '60s had more feeling to it? What was it about that that era that, that caused that? Do you think? Well, I think mainly because people didn't really know what they were doing. They were doing it because they loved it, and they weren't pretending to be somebody. They really were those people, and I think today. What you've got is, is a generation of musicians that have kind of looked at rock stars of the 60s and say to themselves, that's how you're supposed to be to be a rock star, and this is what you do to be a rock star. So it's kind of much more of a manufactured thing, a manufactured in their own mind somehow, much more of a 
opposers kind of. You know, I, I can't really sort of put it in yeah. any better than that. But it's uh, it's they they're they're making the music basically because they want to be rock stars. And in the sixties, the musicians were making the music because that's what they wanted to do, and that's the difference, I think. Do you think there was there was more of a feeling of uh, of experimentation in the sixties? Do you feel like you were the sort of the avant-garde, the, the leaders, the, the people who were molding? Well, I think, I think there probably was a certain amount of that going on, but um, when it was actually happening, it was just people making music, you know. I think when you look back, perhaps as, as soon as two or three years later, you see that, you know, some people were doing some pretty fantastic things, you know, but I think at the time it was just people just trying to play as, uh, as good a music as they could. And that, that was the way it came out, you know, I don't, I don't think it was, I don't think you can be consciously avant-garde, you know. I think if you think you're going to be avant-garde, then you're likely to miss it by several thousand miles, you know. I think it's, you know, I think it's got to be, it's got to come from within, a natural kind of thing that just happens. Because you feel that's right, you know. I think that's, that's what was going on, people just felt that was the way to do it. <laughs> when you were growing up and uh, heard these American records that influenced you, um, then you finally got to come over to America and play. What were your impressions? My first impression of coming to America was that it scared the life out of me <clears throat> because I came into New York with Purple Heart, and all I heard the first night I was there was gunshots and sirens going off. So it was a, it was kind of completely different to how I imagined it um, from the movies, you know. But um, it was a great thrill to play in America. I, it, I mean, I think even now it's still, there's still an excitement for coming over and playing here because all my musical roots are here. Did you ever get to meet any uh, of your peers? Yeah. I met B.B. Uh, King and I met Bobby Bland. I'm hoping that um, through a friend of mine who knows James Brown, I'm hoping to meet him uh, next year when I come back. So that'll be a great thing. Um, who are some of your guitar heroes, and uh, <coughs> are there any specific records that you know that they played on that you really admire? Um, well, my first big guitar influence was many, many years ago now, when I was in the Paramounts, was Steve Cropper with uh, Booker T and the MGs. And then from there, I went on to B.B. King, and I mean, I was mad about B.B. King for years. And um, I also sort of liked, as well as B.B. King, I liked Albert King, and I know it's Rush, I've already mentioned, and... Uh, few other players, but mostly it was it was B.B. King for me, you know, early B.B. King. I liked the sort of stuff he was doing in the 50s and that. And then um, I heard a guy, I only had one record, but uh, it had a tremendous influence on me. I don't even know the guy's name, but it was on a record by um, uh, Bobby Parker called Watch Your Step and The Other Side. And uh, the guitar playing it is, on it is just phenomenal. And I've just never been able to find out who the guy was that played on it. It may even have been Bobby Parker himself, I don't know. It's just one of those records, you know. That was in about 65. And um, the guy had such a tremendous vibrato and feeling, you know, and technique as well, all put together, that uh, it was just phenomenal. And then Hendrix came along, which was in a similar kind of vein. Um, that also had a very, very big influence on me at the time. But uh, I must admit, after the first album of um, Hendrix's, I didn't like anything else he did after that. Until the time came when, after he died, Keith, um, Keith and I decided to write a tribute song to him. So I started listening to you know, some of his stuff because I wanted to make the track sort of as near to Hendrix as I could as a tribute to him. And um, that's when I started to get into Electric Ladyland and a couple of other things. Um, there was still a lot of stuff that didn't touch me at all that he did, but um, I think that's when I was sort of more influenced by him than, than any other time, really. <laughs> 